so anyway, um, get a couple of these things, and then I'll talk about the new projects. The projects are all in the cloud for the next several projects. Uh, there are cloud servers that do all sorts of good things. So you don't really have to install things, which is the way of the world. Most real SOCs use commercial equipment or cloud equipment. It's not really that you spend time setting it up. You spend time learning how to use it. So I'm moving in that direction. Anyway, so um, to start off your investigation, you need some clues. So you need something specific. Uh, so you have to have a complaint from somebody telling you something bad is happening on your network. And then you need stuff that can help you dig deeper, like IP addresses and times. Um, if you have multiple time zones, then you've got a problem there, of course. And a typical thing people do is use Zulu for everything. So there's, here's five checklists to fill out for your initial investigation just to get started so you know how to find more. So there's an incident summary. Oh, you have, to, you have to put this stuff up somewhere, which I know is a big issue for the cyber competition teams, where to store stuff so everybody can see it on every machine, on every OS. There have been many attempts to use OneNote or this or that, and no real solution has appeared. It's actually extremely difficult. <laughs> Um, but anyway, uh, it's the same thing for your IR team. You have to have your some kind of file share so they can all access documents and they can get it all over the place. Uh, don't trust any part of the target's network. That's a big issue um, because you, the bad guy could be snoopy on anything you send through the target network, of course. So for the incident um, detection, you've got the, how things started. You've got it just like a police report. You've got to know who reported it, when did they report it, who wrote down this information, who first investigated it, you know, so you can know who to talk to if you need more information, or at least in the police world, in case some of these people turn out to be suspects. That's not usually such a big issue. Most of the time in IR, you don't really end up fingering people within the company. Although there are some inside attacks, you're primarily focused on external attacks. Um, so you need to know the general category of what happened here, um, what was affected, and what was the thing that made him detect it? Something like an AV alert or something like that occurred. And then you need unique identifiers, not something like an IP address, which probably changes all the time, but something unique like a MAC address or a station number or something. Um, and also, uh, if somebody has been trying to fix it, you need to know that, or you're going to confuse the well-meaning uh, tech department's activities with the criminal's activities. <laughs> what other people have been doing on it since we declared it. And then uh, how much confidentiality is required? You may be a company where it's sort of informal and people can just all work together because like maybe Uber or something, or you might be a heavily regulated financial industry or health industry where you have to contain the information until it goes through your legal team. So only very, very carefully crafted statements will leak out about it. And of course, if you're in the military, then you don't want the adversary to find out that they got in. This is why. Um, the people outside the military with no security clearance that have no responsibilities can say things like I say, which is that um, China hacked RSA and stole the master key and then they used it to hack Lockheed. But the official statement of Lockheed is they never got in. But if you understand how it works, they have to say that. And if they did get in, they have to say that louder. That's why, you know, one of the old rules of, of politics is that you can't believe anything until it has been officially denied. That's what, that's what constitutes proof that it's true. Because uh, you have to lie. You can't admit they got in a stole the crown jewels. You have to keep you have to keep pretending they didn't, even when they obviously did, because you don't want everybody to know they really got your crown jewels. Anyway, um, so then you got the instant detection. So how did you detect it? What information did you have from what source? And are you sure it was accurate? As you're going to see in the projects and everywhere, a lot of your detection tools have false positives. They tell you something is an attack when it's not an attack. And then, have you preserved that data? Because we were talking about this uh, just last Sunday in uh, San Jose at this meeting. I want you to see how long can you store full PCAPs? And the real IR people said, never. You don't store those at all. The data is so big, you can't store that at all. All you have is log entries. The primary data is just impossible to store at the scale of any big network. Um, he was saying uh, 50,000 events per second is common for the log entries on a reasonable corporate network. So the log entries themselves are all you can possibly handle. Storing full PCAPs is just not an option. <laughs> Unless you're like the uh, NSA, storing all the PCAPs for the whole internet in this giant complex in Utah. But it would be prohibitively expensive to do it for any, a large, any reasonable corporate network. And that means you aren't really preserving the data. And you're going to see in the projects, you find some alerts, you go through them, you find evidence. But you probably don't, you don't have the whole package. And you don't have the whole file that was downloaded. All you got is alert. And you don't really know if it's true. 
So anyway, then you see how long the detection source has been running, what are their detection and error rates, and has somebody changed something about your detectors? It might just be that you plugged more data into your IDS and it's triggering more false positives and nothing's really happening. That's often the case. Very often, attacks are non-attacks. I remember when Amazon went down for about four days, about five years ago, everybody said they'd been attacked and Amazon said, no, that was us. We turned on a new system and it fouled up and broke everything. It's usually your own staff just doing a normal thing, not an outside attack. And it looks like an outside attack because all your stuff goes down and everyone runs around blaming each other and screaming, but it often isn't. So then you got more details, exactly what devices are involved, what people are involved, and where is the information, and do you have backups? That would be nice. Then you can compare those to the current situation and see what changed. Find your individual systems, whether they have any malware, whether any remediation has been done. Then you've got your network details. Uh, you want to know all the external malicious IPs and domain names, uh, what monitoring is being done, what remediation has been done, if you're changing firewall rules, or your network diagrams, you've got to know that. And then once you've found malware, there's lots to know about your malware. How did you detect it? What systems have it? Uh, usual stuff, what file names and what does it do? Uh, what network connections does it make? Have, do, did we keep a copy of the malware? Did we find the file that <laughs> constructed the malware? And have we submitted it to third parties like VirusTotal? Because that matters, of course. If you have, then you have exposed the fact that you caught the malware. And that's a thing to know. That's why you know this, just like the cops, what the IR team hates is when the local network admin goes in like an amateur trying to fix the problem before you come in. This is like, I really wish you'd just leave it alone and let us handle it, rather than doing stupid things before we get there. Lawyers say the same thing. I remember I went to uh, the Secret Service conference, they had a defense lawyer up there, and he said, people will, cops will come and say, do you have guns or drugs in the car? And they do. And they say, can we search the car? And they say, yes. So they search the car, they find that stuff, and then he calls me. He's like, what am I supposed to do for you now? Why did you say yes? You're supposed to call me before you do stupid things so I can stop you. This is why most of the lawyers won't defend Trump. They say, he won't listen to me, he won't shut up, and he won't pay the bill. And so I'm not working for this guy. The number one thing lawyers say is, shut up, shut up, shut up, let me do the talking. That's what I'm here for. I know how to say the right things that will save you. Don't just spout off stupid things on Twitter while I'm trying to save you. <laughs> anyway. Isn't Giuliani kind of stupid as well? Like, well, Giuliani is, seems to suit him. But yes, Giuliani seems to shoot, blurt his mouth off and confess things that appear to be criminal too. I know. It's kind of like the Three Stooges go to Washington. <laughs> anyway. Um, but that's what the people wanted. They wanted someone who was not an insider and would not act like one. They got it. Anyway, so anyway, you keep track of your notes, and your notes may be discoverable. This has happened to me. I took sloppy, slang-filled notes, and then they were going to court, and they were mad at me. I didn't know any better. Well, you have to consider that. Your notes may be discoverable evidence in court. So you'll have an attack timeline. You know, when you somebody opened an email, now it created some things, like in the prefetch file, there was a thing created, which means a file has been used, and then they call the IT security department to report something, and then we start collecting data, live response data, and that's a few entries on a timeline that you should have recording all these things. So as you analyze, you can see what else happened based on those times. Then typically, you have the same priorities. Who broke in? This may or may not be important to you. Typically, most corporations couldn't, I was just talking, to him about this before class, most people don't care who broke in. Unless you're the military or the government, you're not going to do anything about it. All you care about is what they got and how to get rid of them. Are they still in there? Um, but if you are the military or law enforcement, then you might want to know who got in and actually try to stop them in that way. Anyway, and if you have a PCI, then you've got um, financial data and that's got special age situations. And if you have other things like larceny by staff, you might want to prosecute or copyright infringement or medical data. Those are all special legal issues with have special concerns. So you have to talk to management. And uh, this is the big reason why people get IR teams and keep improving them because the to well, they want to know the total time for mediation. How long will it take you to figure it out, fix the problem, and we can say it's done? And if you typically, it takes a really long time when you're new to it. And the more professional you get, the faster it gets. And that's your main score that management cares about. How long before I can really tell everybody this is all fixed and we don't have to worry about it anymore? Um, it can take a long time. I just saw another uh, measurement. At uh, this conference, a typical company takes 200 days to notice they've been breached, oh. even now. 
and it's been that way for years. Most companies, I imagine, never notice at all. I mean, typically, the way they find out is they find out from the FBI that comes to them and says, well, we were investigating this other company, and we found the command and control server, and they stole your data, too, last year. So <coughs> you might want to tell your customers all your data has been stolen for the last year, and they're probably still in your network because you don't even know. That's the normal situation. Yeah? Uh, the same my target market is uh, startups. Um, which is very different from corporate. What's your experience with startups and their uh, management buy-in, and how do you overcome the lack of resources? I've never done it, um, so all I have is generalities. Um, I know most startups, I think, don't think about security very much. I mean, they're not a target until they have a public presence. So, I mean, I think their number one issue is to just get it, get their product available. And that, of course, is security. Security is confidentiality, integrity, and availability. And if you don't have availability, nothing else matters. So first, you just have to create your product at all and get some buzz. And then you have something to secure. Unless you're a security company, I would. Um, what most people do is not worry about security until later. And I think that is right. Because you have to actually have a product. And also, many startups have a business model, which is just get a lot of buzz and then sell out to Google. So really, you can take any long-term problem and pass that on to the person that buys you out. You really don't have to solve issues like security, because you'll just be bought by a huge company and integrated into their infrastructure anyway, so who cares? You know, those are just general considerations, but I don't have any specific uh, information. I'll have guest speakers that may know more. I haven't got them scheduled yet, but I'm beginning to. The, I'm trying to get this guy from the South Bay, and I'll probably have a lot more, because I'm going to be talking at a, teaching a class at a conference. Oh, in fact, I should put it on the list of conferences. I just found out about this one coming up. We, had, we used to have a conference here called Bay Threat. Ah. And it went away, but there's a new one which looks like it's going to be the replacement. And it's Stay down here. Hack the Valley. There it is in October. So keep an eye on this. This, is good. this looks like uh, our local DEF CON-like conference, which we have not had for a few years. We used to have one. They come and go. But we clearly need a major security conference in this area, and that's what these guys are trying to do. So I'll be teaching a class there and, and have a lot of talks and stuff. And this is the second year, apparently, of this one. So this may become the regular San Francisco area regional con. And I think that would be good. We used to have one around Christmas time. Um, and I think we need one. Enough security going on around here. So here's a, a case history. So somebody has a WHERE's site. They, they ran an, an automated vulnerability scanner and found a vulnerability, got it through management interface, and then started selling illegal stuff on the corporate network, which happens all the time. And management wants to find and prosecute the person. But of course, this is just a common automated attack. Um, it's probably pointless and vindictive for them to try to hunt down and prosecute the criminal. That really doesn't do you any good, because there's a 1,000 more criminals like them. You really should just patch your stuff and not worry about it, unless you are in law enforcement. It is a waste of your company resources to attempt to be law enforcement. In my opinion, I tend to agree. This is, um, I think, I might as well say, I, I, I think the old laissez-faire capitalism makes sense. Like right now, Twitter and Facebook are trying to censor political talk on their, their platform. And I thought it would be perfectly fine to have it. You can say anything you want until people start leaving and we're losing money. Then we kick you off. I don't see why that's wrong. It's a money profit-making business. But uh, anyway, uh, it's an issue here. Um, so I got a few cahoots about that, and let's try that. So which one of these is false? OK, that's the thing that usually you do not have an insider. It's not impossible, but it's usually that's not the case. All right, I would get that out of the way if I could figure out how. Anyway, all right, which one of these is not normally performed for individual systems? Yeah, this is what uh, the CTO did at this college. He claimed we had a network intrusion, which was false, and he claimed that we weren't allowed to see the evidence because it was all locked up for the FBI to analyze. And uh, it is not true, of course. All right, which one is usually not important? It's usually this one, although that is changing. We have more and more supply chain attacks, and people are beginning to say we really should not be using equipment from China. But there is no equipment that didn't come from China, so I don't know who you're fooling. There's no way you can buy anything that isn't made by China. So it might be true that China could poison the supply chain, but it's not clear what any of us can do about it. <laughs> anyway, um, let me record the winners of this, and then I think we, are, uh, we can just carry on a bit here. 
So let's look at the initial development of leads. A lead is a bit of evidence that is helpful in that you can use it to find more evidence. So you want something like an IP address, an identity of a name you can search for in emails, something like that. So you need something relevant to the problem, something actionable, and enough detail that you can search for more things like it. And the first thing you have to do is make sure you have clarity on what you've measured so you know what you've got. Make sure it's actually true, because remember, a lot of things are not really true. Some alert goes off and says you've been hacked, but you haven't really been hacked. It was just something else. And then try to figure out in context uh, how to use this lead to move further. So NIDS is where you often start. That's the whole point of the thing. It's supposed to alert you when you're under attack. So logically, you'll get an alert from this, and hopefully some reasonable percentage of the time, it's actually true. So now you have some kind of network indication, some kind of clue, some kind of IP address, and now you can begin to look for other packets going to that address or similar to that packet in some way. Um, you may have to consider DHCP to get the correct addresses assigned to things. Um, if humans are the source, humans may be just misunderstanding something and thinking they're under attack when they aren't, automated systems make the same mistake. And now, by the way, I should mention the main point of one of the talks I saw down south was machine learning. <laughs> um, so they now are having AI run your NIDs. That is really happening. That's why I really want the guy to come give us a talk to here. And of course, that means your NIDS is like a human. It may be mistaken. In fact, he said one huge problem is when you, when you make an AI, you have to train it on like a million real things. And what they're doing is, first, they would like to train it with real data, but you can never get real data. No company can ever give you real data because they got personal information in it. So you have fake data. So you train it on fake data so it learns wrong. And nobody has a clear answer for this. So what you do is you train it on fake data until you think it's going. Then you connect it. He said he was distributing this to customers, giving them the, the AI machine to protect their network. And they say, it's not working. They said, oh, just wait, and it will learn. And then after a few weeks, it still doesn't learn. And the customers are really unhappy. And they're like, you know, this is seriously not working. <laughs> this is why I know the old-fashioned technique, which Cloudflare uses and uh, Jeremiah Grossman's White Hat used, is to have all your customers join a club and all share the data with the company so it does have access to everybody's data and it accepts the requirement of protecting it. And that would seem to be the way to do it. That's how Google's spam filter works, Postini. It has everybody's inbox, and they look to see if, how many people have marked this thing spam, and then take it out of everybody else's inbox, too. So since they violate the confidentiality of their own users by sharing it at a central point, then they can actually get the data they need. This is why Europe has data sharing laws. So one company can share data with other companies for purposes of defense, and they will not get sued for it. And there have been many attempts to pass that law in America, which have all failed. So right now, AT&T cannot tell Comcast what attacks are happening in any useful way. So each one of them has to independently develop defenses. It's, it's a problem. Anyway. Um, so now you turn your leads into viable indicators so you can scan your network and find out what machines have been compromised and find more suspicious conditions and move forward. Move forward. So you want um, things that are observable characteristics. These are property-based indicators, things like registry keys, files, MD5 hashes, mutexes we're playing with in the malware analysis class. Mutexes are file handles in the memory of a machine which are, can be viewed by any other process. So they are a mark which lets other processes know that something is in use. And malware often uses it so that when someone reruns the malware, it will not reinfect the same box. And you can scan for them with network queries. So then you've got methodology based. Uh, rather than looking for one specific file, you look for malicious behavior. Um, one thing, one place where this really works is ransomware. Ransomware has a very suspicious behavior. You download one file, and suddenly thousands of machines, thousands of files are all being written on your machine all at once, which is totally because it's encrypting every file. That's actually very easy to spot when you look for it because there is no normal thing you run that starts changing every file. So that's a good case where there's an obvious behavioral pattern to look for. So yeah. <clears throat> So it's still going to be the same number of files, right? If they encrypt right, it. Right, right. That's what you usually do. They encrypt them and delete. Yes, right. But you still, no, nothing else would go through every file in a folder and change right to every one of them. Right, right. So that's why. Uh, otherwise, it would be useless to have, it couldn't get ransomware. Yeah, so I mean, the only thing I can think of is maybe a backup utility you might zip everything, one file after the other. So that might be the only case of a legitimate activity going on that would look like that. But you can whitelist that. And, you know, it's, it's a reasonable. It's a pretty good indicator, a behavioral indicator, so it doesn't really matter 
um, what version of ransomware you get. And the bad guys would have to somehow upgrade their ransomware to gradually, randomly encrypt the files or something. And I haven't heard of them doing that yet. But if these behavioral detections become more common, then they will. And it's in a project for one of my classes now to set that up at Sysmon to detect this. It's been a pretty well-known technique. So I think it's increasingly true that people do have a defense that will chop the entire generic category of ransomware. Yeah? This is a rookie question. But, yeah. Uh, so I, will the ransomware follow uh, your links from uh, your local hard drive up to the cloud? Yes, yes, that's a very important question. Will they encrypt the cloud too? And it does, and that's why it's so bad. It encrypts not only your local files, but all the network shares you can get to, and that means your Dropbox and your company file shares. It's basically a network share, and it can yes. be encrypted. Yes, and that's why it does so much damage. If it was just one workstation, who would care? You just reimage the workstation. The problem is it affects large corporate networks, and then it spreads, and it affects the cloud machines. Other people use that cloud file now are infected too. That's why it does things like wipe out whole hospitals and airports and stuff. That's why you really need to deploy a behavior-based system that will notice when something is changing a lot of files and block it until we get approval. Yeah? So who's liable in that case? Like who... Oh, wow. Isn't that an interesting question? Who's liable? I would think it's all the company. I think when you deploy something like Dropbox, there's this terms of service. And I would imagine they say, if you somehow do, if you send signals from your machine that change your files in your Dropbox, that is not our fault. <laughs> I would think so. But certainly, it would be tempting to try to sue Dropbox and get them to pay for it. So that's a good question. I haven't heard of anybody trying to sue their cloud providers over it. But uh, maybe they'd be able to find a way to do it. Offhand, I would think most of the cloud providers have really ruthless terms of service that say security is your problem. Don't come whining to us. The only thing we do is provide the equipment and keep it up. And what happens to your data from your machine when you come in with authorization password to change things, that is not our fault. But, you know, it's an interesting issue. I know in the past there was a bank that did not update their website, and people could only use it by using an out-of-date Adobe reader. And so somebody used that, got hacked, and they stole all his money by stealing the password off his machine, and he sued the bank, saying it was their fault, and the bank won that it was his fault because they had his password and logged in, and that's not their problem, even though they forced him to use unsafe software. Uh, and this, I think, is why lawyers get frustrated and they say they lose things they should have won because they cannot communicate the technical details to juries and judges. But it is an issue, and to be fair, you know, exactly when it's, whose fault something is, is really quite tough. Yeah. Yeah, on the, like a mobile forensics, then the, I guess law enforcement would target the cloud because you might not be able to see search a phone, but you should, they can search a, a cloud, can't they? Oh yeah, that is definitely true. It is certainly much easier for law enforcement to get data from the cloud than from the individual phones. They do have big forensic departments at the FBI and the police department of, with analyzing all these phones, but if they can get your iCloud backups, it's much easier. They don't need a warrant. They do. They just need a court order. They send a court order to Apple. Apple will give them the stuff. But that's easy to do, and that's a routine process. Um, and it's much technically less demanding than getting in everybody's phones, which are all different. It's so, all acquired. Right? Yeah. Um, and I think you know they do both. But I think you're right. The cloud, that's why a lot of privacy advocates are really unhappy with the cloud, because it totally means the government can find your stuff a whole lot easier. That's why the sort of uh, privacy-oriented people will do things like run their own email server, because they're absolutely right. If you run your own email server in your basement, it is much harder for law enforcement to get a look at that than if you use Gmail or something. Hillary. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. If Hillary wanted to hide nasty things, running her own server would be the way to do it. And that's probably part of all the people that are blaming her for everything. And, it's, it, and in fact, it did create the situation where she did refuse to hand over a bunch of emails and claim that she had decided of her own wisdom that they were not relevant. And that led to the endless argument of did she hide dirty secrets in there or not. If it had been an official government email account, it wouldn't have been her making that decision. And she wouldn't be up for that criticism. You know, running your own email uh, gives you a responsibility which you might not really want to have. I tried, one time, I was going to stick some uh, monitors in the hacking lab. I was going to stick up webcams and record video trace. And then I thought, you know, if I do that, then I'm going to be responsible for like law enforcement requests to see that data. And I've created a problem I probably don't want to create. That's why the wisest thing to do with personal data is not collect it. Because once you do collect it, you now have a large responsibility to protect it 
and delete it on demand and hand it over to law enforcement on demand, you've got a lot of problems now that you could have avoided by just not collecting that data. So here's, here's your, you get data from the initial lead, then you um, track down, you analyze it and find more information, create and edit some IOCs, then publish them to hunt around through your network for more, and then you go around in a circle. Find more evidence, improve your leads, and go around in a circle until you feel like you've thoroughly understood this event enough to mitigate. Uh, so you end up with binary classification. Your endpoint is either interesting or not. You have some kind of test. It either has this file or it doesn't, and I only care about the ones that have this file. You're hoping to have a good set of indicators of compromise that will quickly decide which machines are involved and which machines are not involved so you can get somewhere. So there are some specific examples which come from this book, which we're using in another course, but this is just a book written by the authors, so they have it. It's also got a bunch of fake malware to analyze, which is good stuff to start from. So if you're you can start from a hash. If the MD5 hash equals something, then I've got an alert. That means the malware is on the machine. Now, the good thing about this kind of thing is it has a low false positive. There's essentially no chance that it will accidentally have that MD5 hash. So that's good. The only problem is um, it is trivial for the bad guy to avoid. All they have to do is change the file in any way, and the hash is different. So this is low false positive, but a high false negative. Any variation of the file means you could have a bunch of infected machines that you fail to detect with this kind of rule. Um, now, Windows files are portable executable files. This is the standard format for all Windows executables, DILs, COMs, and EXEs. And the PE file header has a list of the library functions that are going to be used. So you might want to take the hash, or if it was compiled at exactly this time, or the file size is exactly this big, that would be a broader group of things which would more likely detect even small variations on the file and still not trigger too often on false positives. Yeah? I didn't understand the uh, time, the header time yeah. date thing. With yeah, in the header of, uh, we, we do it in the malware analysis class, in the PE file starts with a header and the header has the language it was written in, the compile date, the author's name, and the name of all the libraries it uses. That's just the structure of the file. And they, those things do not have to be filled in with real information, except for the libraries. But if you use a normal tool like Visual Studio, it automatically fills them in. And most malware authors, just like most software developers, authors don't know this and just leave it in there. Just like most people that take pictures with their phone leave the location stamp on the picture because they don't know it's there. So uh, this is why if you read Kaspersky reports, they always tell you what nation did the attacking by figuring out what time zone they were in, by what time the files were compiled. And so this is quite common that you look at this compile date. And in fact, this is often used in attribution to discern which files came from the same attack because they're all compiled within a few seconds of each other. They're all part of the same malware attack. So this is one way to go. Um, and that's a way to make it more vague. Another way would be to look at the DNS cache. So if, the, uh, um, if, your CNS, if you look in the DNS cache of that machine and it has gone to the command and control centers domain name recently, that also indicates this machine is infected. So the presence of this file or a, 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 a suspicious domain name in the DNS cache or a service running, which comes from the malware, or a certain file name found, you know, you have a whole list of conditions, all of which are suspicious, and if any of these happen, then you treat that machine as uh, apparently infected and of interest. And of course, this means you catch more infected machines and you're probably going to begin to get false positives too as you make your condition more vague. And that's so you're trying to have a balance here. You're just trying to make it so you get enough information to quickly decide if a machine is infected, and you're not so complicated that your scanner takes too long to do the job. So it's a problem. Snort, which you'll be setting up in the projects, is famous for this. You can write snort rules, and you can write them with regular expressions and make them as complicated as you want. But if you make them complicated, then the snort can't keep up with the rate of network traffic anymore. So you really have to use snort for a simple cursory scanning to do the fast check and then use something else to uh, find the rest of it. Yeah. Is that an inability to keep up with the network scanning a function of the processing speed? Yes, it's a function. Yes, it's a function of processing speed. So you could improve it by having more processors than a cluster of machines doing the scanning. And the, the real powerful IDSs do that. Absolutely. So you could try to balance it by adding more power, but you get most of the value out of writing your rules more carefully so they don't use up so much CPU. And when we did the boss of the SOC, the same thing's true of Splunk. It is very easy to write Splunk queries that will take an hour to run. And one of the things you have to learn when using Splunk is how to write queries that will not take too long to run. 
same thing is true of all database engines. I used to be a database administrator, and so you've, you have to make queries, you have to understand how the database works, or you will give it a task that is too difficult. And there's probably a way to get what you need done without presenting it with such a complicated task. And so the import table is the thing I mentioned before. This is the part of the PE header that pulls in libraries. So it can use library functions. And every Windows program primarily uses libraries to do everything. Oh, use libraries to open URLs and write files and everything. The main It just calls library functions to do all the work. So there are standard libraries that are used. And malware often uses strange library calls to try to avoid being detected. So here's an import table, for example. If you look in here, and it's going to create a service, create a key, read a file, create a thread, internet open URL, and all that, you can look for the particular library functions used by the malware and raise an alert for that. Once again, this is more likely to catch all the malware, but it's also going to have some false positives because these library functions are not all that obscure. Um, so probably plenty of legitimate software will also use those but maybe not too many legitimate software has that exact pattern. And then you can have uh, indicators of compromise um, that are not malware. Uh, for example, this is the old one, and we use this in the hacking class to bypass passwords. This is an old trick that works fine. You replace this file, sethc.exe. I don't know what it stands for, but it's the handicapped accessibility. If you press the Alt key or something five times, then the on-screen keyboard comes up with this file. So if you replace it with cmd.exe, then you press the Alt key five times, you get a command prompt as system. Before you log in, you own the box. You can reset the administrator password. It's an old trick, and it still works. So you might want to detect if people are doing that on your network. And so the way it works is they replace this file with another file, and typically they replace it with cmd.exe. Um, another way to do it is to uh, put it in the debug handler so that when something crashes, it will call it. Anyway, you can detect file replacement um, by looking for the MD5 hash. So if the hash of seth.exe is actually equal to the hash of command.exe instead, then you know it's infected. But there are more than one version of command.exe, more than one possible MD5 hash. So you could try listing all the uh, reasonably close versions of cmd.exe hashes but um, you might want to use something vaguer. And one simple thing was that CMD is always bigger than Seth.e. So that would be a much simpler way to do it. If Seth is just bigger than it should be, then something bad is going on here, and we should raise an alert. That's probably a lot better. It's faster and easier for your scanner to perform, and it gets the job done. And that's the way you got to think. There was a misspelling in the quiz for that. Could be. Yeah. Anyway, um, so the um, anyway, you can look for debugger keys. This will look for something in the image file execution options to tell you if the debugger is calling seth.exe to debug a process that crashes, which is of course also wrong, and something you might do to get in by triggering an invalid condition. And then there's formats for these rules. This is Mandiant's open IOC format, which they, of course, like in the book. They write it this way. It looks like a sort of XML-based language with these uh, tree-structured directory, just a way to write it. The, not, the, most, the standard in the business is snort rules, but this is another way to do it, a language to write this stuff in. Anyway, so if registry key equals this, then if the key contains Seth C, then raise the alert. That's the sort of pseudocode, looks sort of like C or Python. And uh, the IOC format is just a way to express that in a way that they are obviously are hoping will become standard and adopted by more tools. But so far, that has not really happened. As far as I know, the only real standards in this business are snort rules and Yara rules. Those are widely accepted. And we'll get into Yara. I can't find a good tutorial for it. But Yara is essentially snort for the local file system. And it does very simple pattern matching on the local file system. Um, and it is the standard. So pretty much every tool has to accept snort format rules for network traffic and Yara rules for local files. And these other contenders are not winning, as far as I can tell, at trying to replace it with a better standard format. But here's how it would look in there. You have an or and an and to these items here. And obviously, you have to create it in some kind of special tool. Anyway, so uh, you've got your network-based indicators. And again, you're looking for some kind of pattern here. I went to a talk by an Akamai researcher at a Bay Thread about five years ago. And this was when the Al-Qassam Cyber Army was hacking all the American banks. 
to punish us for putting a, a video on YouTube that insulted Mohammed, they calculated what they regarded as the mathematical damage caused by the insult of that video. They turned it into dollars and they decided to carefully do that much damage to American banks. It was a rather strange thing to do, but they carefully cost American banks a certain number of million dollars every month as long as we didn't take down that video. And they had a whole series of attacks. And they, they had a secret talk, which they couldn't get any cameras into, because they were telling us what the current rules were. And there were like 15 different waves of attacks. Every couple of weeks, there'd be another wave of attack on the bank. And at the beginning, they were very primitive. The early attacks just had a get string with an, a file name that was like 50 A's in a row. So all you had to do was look for, for 10, more than 10 A's in a row and that block it. And that's easy to put in snores. And so they were blocking it, but they didn't want people to know they had figured that out. And every week they would upgrade it, and they'd have to upgrade the rules, and there'd be sort of a secret meeting among the anti-DDoS people figuring out how to spread the latest rules and how to not hopefully spread it to the al Qassam cyber army any faster than usual so they would know how to upgrade. Um, anyway, so DNS monitoring is another way to go. You can watch for query strings on DNS. This is how you do lots of network security monitoring because DNS is typically sent in UDP unencrypted traffic from everybody who goes to any internet website so you can easily look for anything you don't like. In this case, it would be the command and control center. Domain name, if it's predictable and known, you can just spot who's sending data to that and whoever that is, they're probably infected. A DNS has a very simple format. It's defined in the RFCs. There's just a query type and a query class all sent in unencrypted traffic. So the domain name is split in labels. So you've got 18 bytes for this name of this thing and then three for the uh, top level domain dot com after it. And you just have to express it correctly. If you catch a DNS query, it just has the domain name in plain text right there. So you can just look for the domain name in plain ASCII going down the network and you'll spot it. By the way, the same thing is true of HTTPS, which I found pretty revolting when I tried it because HTTPS has to get your security certificate before it can use the encryption. And the security certificate has your domain name in plain text. So HTTPS also sprays in plain text the, name of the domain you're going to over the network, which is pretty rude. If you don't want all this horrible stuff happening to you, the simple answer is use a VPN. Although 80% of VPNs will not help you because they don't work correctly. Uh, anyway, um, <laughs> this, is, this is why you know most, this is why security awareness is, is a highly questionable activity because for most amateurs, the answer is, well, you know, you really better just let us secure your stuff because most of the things you're going to do aren't really going to help. Like, a lot of people say, I don't use online banking. I'm safe. And I'm like, dude. My browser is the same way when we did the study in the, in the, the lab where a browser's HTTPS was the redirect of HTTP or something like that. Uh, that's not the browser. That is servers. Uh, most servers have wised up. But there's, there's uh, idiots that haven't caught up like Salesforce. Salesforce still uses an HTTP redirect of 302 to HTTPS which means I don't know why they bother encrypting their stuff at all. Um, and, but an enormous number of people do not understand this. It's, um, but more and more people are noticing. But that one, the browsers won't flag it yet. So that'll probably persist for years yet. Mm. Anyway, here's a snort signature. They look like this, uh, alert, you, this thing. Then you give it a message to print in the log when it happens. Then you have this sort of uh, uh, matching, pattern matching thing, grep looking thing. 18, 18 characters, practical malware analysis, followed by three characters, followed by com, followed by null byte. That's the pattern you're looking for. And when it finds it, it will print it out and have some uh, limits on how many of these per second it will alert and so on. This format, which is famously very, very unpleasant to write and very irritating, very easy to break, is the standard format for these rules. I might give you homework where you have to write these rules, but I'm kind of thinking I won't do that. Um, even the experts say they hate writing these rules. <laughs> and the only way you ever get it right is to copy a rule that's working and make small changes. Anyway, um, <laughs> it's, it's very annoying, but it is the standard. That's why there's a lot of pressure to make another standard, but tough. That chip has sailed. Anyway, uh, then there's dynamic analysis, which is big, clean, fun. You um, deliberately infect a box with the malware and see what it does. So you monitor um, the network. And then you run the malware, and then you see what DNS resolution it makes. And then if you want to uh, continue 
to analyze it without connecting the internet, then you run a fake internet around it with a tool like INET SIM that we use in the practical malware analysis class so that the malware doesn't actually phone home. But it thinks it phones home because I run a proxy server that will answer any request. So it thinks it's talking to somebody and that's how you can see what network traffic it tries to send. So uh, once you have an indicator of compromise, you want to test it on a test system of like a few infected VMs or something. Make sure there's two basic tests, and it's basically false positives and false negatives. Make sure that your data does in fact detect the malware. It is in fact relevant to the indicator, and then make sure that it doesn't just happen on clean machines also, which is often the case. These are your false positives, those are your false negatives. That's the point. You have to test your IOC to make sure that it has a reasonably high false positive rate and a reasonably low false negative rate. I mean, excuse me, neither of them should be false. Anyway, so here's a common attack life cycle. This is typically what you do. You send an email to the company and get somebody to click on an attachment. This is how most pen tests work. This is how most real intrusions work. They typically start with phishing because it works almost every time. Somebody in that company will click on stuff. In fact, um, the one that got um, RSA and broke into all those tokens, somebody actually, the intrusion detection system found the infected email and somebody actually fished it out of the trash can to open it to get infected. Ah. It's the problem, you know, if it's social engineering. You have to make it interesting to read that document. And somebody will read that document and then you're dead meat. Ah. And so they open the document, uh, you have some kind of exploit that takes over one box. Um, now that downloads more malware, removes the dropper, and the second stage continues on its way, infecting more machines, stealing credit credentials, spreading around, and maybe that's, that's how it goes. Maybe yeah. That's where uh, the term deep dive comes from, huh? Dumpster? Yeah, dumpster diving, deep diving. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's true for a lot of things. Anyway, so um, less effective indicators are properties of the dropper, because the dropper doesn't even stay around long. The dropper is the original email thing, but that runs once and goes away, so analyzing that is not going to really find the infected machines. It's only going to find the ones that are freshly infected while you're scanning. Um, this is, of course, what email scanners do, because they're trying to stop it before it reaches the machine, and that's a useful prevention technique, but it's not a way to detect what got through. So a more effective indicator will be um, the persistence mechanism. Uh, the prefetch directory records the last 128 programs that have been launched on that machine, and it's typically not cleared, so it persists for quite a while after the, dro after the dropper has run. Um, look, at most recently used documents also persist for a while, so those would be better. Um, you might find something in the browser history if they fetched a file over the internet or the DNS cache, or metadata for the second stage malware. These are better things to look for. And then there's the problem of data common to the environment. You have to run your indicator on clean workstations and see that it doesn't trigger. This was a big issue with, um, with the early generation of rootkit detectors. I mean, the rootkit detectors came out, I tried running them, and it gave me like 128 alerts on a brand new, freshly installed Windows Vista machine. I'm like, well, this is not helping me. It detected like a certain type of file handle that was suspicious, and Microsoft had started using that for backward compatibility all over the time. I think it was, um, Microsoft had a new kind of shortcut they added to Windows Vista to be backwards compatible with Windows XP, and it was apparently making toast of this, uh, <laughs> this rootkit detector. Yes. Anyway, so um, that's the issue. Make sure that your so-called detection tool doesn't detect clean machines as dirty, or you're going to get nowhere. Yeah. Sam, I'm sorry, I came to your class late. Do yeah. these slides uh, align with the book in any way? Yeah, yeah, they should be following through the book in order. Because I, I can't find any of these. Well, the, well, it is in there. Right. Um, right. Yeah, we're near to the end of uh, the second chapter, which I think is chapter five. Okay. Yeah. Anyway, cool. and the slides are also on my page to download for what they're worth, but you do just follow through the book. Okay, yeah. all, all good, Sam. Thanks. Yeah, good. Anyway, um, so then, of course, another problem is that your scanning processes are infecting your corporate network. You are now sending data over the network, running processes on the machines, and you might be fouling up the machines, especially if you write those unfortunate rules that require a whole lot of processing time to compare every file to a complicated regular expression, you might be bogging down the servers and workstations with your scanner. So that's a thing to know. You would want to know if your scanner freezes an important company process before you deploy it and make an enemy. Because um, of course, you don't want the cure to be worse than the disease. So um, you want to document your leads, uh, interview people correctly. When you interview people, let them tell you what they have to say without 
try to argue with them. First find out what they say. Then decide it's wrong later. But you first let them finish saying what they're saying. And um, once you have all the facts, then you know what to do. External parties are a real problem. And as you outsource stuff and put everything in the cloud, this happens more and more, those people really won't tell you much. You're probably not entitled to know much. You probably aren't entitled to see the logs of those servers or anything because they have other people's data in them too. And that's, of course, an issue. Um, and now the cops can send them subpoenas and court orders and get data out of external parties, but companies typically can't. Unless they put that in their service level agreement, when they outsource the stuff, they're going to find that they do not have the right to view very much of what goes on on the server. Then there's legal options. If you really want to pursue people and you don't know who they are, there's a John Doe lawsuit where you get a judgment against somebody even though you don't know who they are. Their name is like Burger Boy in a chat room, and you can actually get a lawsuit against Burger Boy in a chat room. And if they ever figure out who Burger Boy is, then they can punish him. But in the meantime, technically, <laughs> there is a punishment hanging over their head. Um, I'm not, that's why I say most companies just forget about this. What good does this do you? <laughs> this is a total waste of your time. Um, anyway, uh, copyright infringement is one of the uh, sweet spots. The Digital Millennium Copyright Act is written to make it very easy for anybody to take down anything, anytime. All you have to do is tell them it's copyrighted, and all the third parties are obligated to take it down while the argument rages of whether it really was copyrighted or not. And this is why this is typically used as a censorship mechanism by everybody. Ridiculous, blatantly, obviously false DMCA notices are used all the time to take down anything you don't like because the third parties have a thing called the safe harbor where they cannot be sued as long as they take down anything as soon as there's a complaint. Whether the complaint is valid or not is not their issue. So you can totally get things off YouTube or anywhere and, only, and the people that want to put it back have to now go to court and fight. So it's like nuisance lawsuits. It's a way to sort of abuse the law. Yeah. So how much would legal options would cost a company? Well, uh, that just depends on how many lawyers they have and how many lawyers you have. There's a so bunch they of. They could really spend million dollars. Oh yes. Oh yes. That's not enough. That's right. So if somebody like Microsoft comes and says you have to take this down, then unless you got a million bucks to spend on lawyers, you probably have to just swallow it and accept it, because even if you're wrong, you're going to have to prove that in court, and they got a lot of lawyers to bog it up, and waste your time. That's. The problem with the legal system here, and there's, uh, and this is like the patent trolls. There's one judge in Texas who lets everybody sue for patent infringement anytime, apparently just because he gets bribed or something. But as everyone knows, there's this one district you go through in Texas, and you can claim that anybody is violating your patent anytime, and you can flood them with lawsuits. And there's many tech companies going through this one guy to hold up innovation all over the place. It's a huge problem, and I think. In the last six months, there have finally been some laws uh, enforced to limit the number of nuisance patent lawsuits. But this is a problem with the American system. You can totally punish people with spurious lawsuits. Microsoft did this for 10 years against Linux. They secretly funded third parties to, to make lawsuits suing, claiming that Linux was proprietary owned by someone and everyone using Linux was running pirate software. And they had no basis at all for this statement, so they hired lawyers to just snarl it up and delay it so it would linger for years in the court. So companies would feel like there was a potential financial risk for using Linux. And Microsoft lied and hid this, and it finally came out that they had been secretly funding all this for years. Now they finally embraced Linux and gotten over it, but for about 10 years they did that. And that's all legal in America. It's just the kind of dirty stuff that people don't like much. Anyway. Um, what is pre litigation dis discovery? What's that? Pre, what's pre-litigation? Oh, pre-litigation discovery. Uh, pre-litigation discovery is um, you're going to sue somebody, so you get a discovery order from the court. And they say, you have to hand over all the information about this. This is what happened to Google. Oracle came to them and said, you've been using Java on Android phones, and we want royalties. And so Google was required to hand over for discovery all their documents about the planning and engineering of how they put Java on Android phones. And that discovery, the e-discovery company made a mistake and sent them a damning document, which they could have not sent them, but they made a mistake and accidentally sent them the letter where one of the early engineers said, dude, we better not use Java because Oracle owns it and we don't have royalties. And they said, shut up, shut up, shut up, shut up. Bury that. We'll just go on here. And then that came out later. Same thing happened to Microsoft in like the early 90s when they sabotaged MS-DOS to kill a competing Microsoft Word, a competing word processor. 
he had the emails from him saying, yes, let's kill off that, make it so it doesn't run on DOS. That'll get rid of them. They're irritating idiots anyway. Why should we bother to let them live? And then in court, he tried to lie and said he hadn't done that. And they had the emails there. So that's pre-litigation, before it goes. Yeah, before yeah. It's it's some, yeah I'm not quite sure about how it fits in. It's, 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 a discovery is an early stage of litigation. Because if you, you can fail discovery. The litigation is already started. Yeah, you get a court order and, and for the evidence. And you can fail this, and you lose the lawsuit immediately. There was a company completely destroyed in a Japanese company about five years ago. They were sued. They were given a discovery order. They failed to provide the evidence. And if you don't provide the evidence to the satisfaction of the judge, there is a summary judgment against you, assuming the evidence is the worst thing it could possibly be. So that was the end of the company. So it's, it's a really big deal. This is why if you want a job, a forensic-oriented job to get is an e-discovery company. Some of my several of my students are now working in e-discovery companies around here. It's a big job. You pay people to come into your network to find all the stuff to make sure that you really do have all the documents pertaining to this. They have to scan through your servers and backups and all your weird old versions of your word processor and all that junk. It's quite a job to find all the documents with these key keywords in it and make sure that they're all tidy for the other side. And if you don't do it right, you lose in court. Yeah. So your former students are cataloging all the discovery items? Yeah, one of them works at an e-discovery company and he's even hiring more. Yeah, it's, there's four basic jobs if you hit computer forensics. There's data recovery, right. get back stuff's been deleted, there's criminal investigations, there's incident response where we are here, and there's e-discovery. Those are the four major job categories um, that use computer forensics tools. All of which is essentially the same thing. You're scanning a bunch of computer equipment trying to find certain things that are not terribly easy to find. And they each have a variety of uh, software products designed to make it easier. If you are in business for a while and you get used to the fact that if you run a business in America, you're just going to have a steady chain of lawsuits, then you install um, indexing software on all your networks that automatically indexes everything. And that's part of what the problem was with Hillary's email server. The, the government has official things running on their servers to make the required backups and archive of government information so it can reply to these orders. And you're not supposed to have government um, processes happening on non-government servers where none of that can happen. And that's part of why if I teach an official online class here, I'm probably going to be not allowed to let anybody in except the official students and not use the API and all this stuff because they will really force me to use the official CCFF lame Canvas server because they're required to report certain things. And they really want to know that all the students are where they expect them to be. And uh, so I'm thinking probably it's not good for me to teach an online class. It's better for me to teach face-to-face -face classes with the online as a supplement, because then I can do any damn thing I want, or at least so far I can. Yeah. Hey, I'm sorry, Sam. Hey, you said right. uh, four fields. Uh, I got e-discovery, yeah. investigations. E-discovery, uh, criminal investigation, incident response, and, um, data. and data recovery. Okay, cool. Which is what Drive Savers does, to recover accidentally lost data. Those are all very similar activities technically, but they're all exploding fields. And so those are the four fields of what? Computer forensics. That's, that's, cool. Those, I think, are the main job categories that you go into after you learn computer forensics. Okay, cool. And you're all very much similar things, where you have to really understand how data is stored and how to hunt through big piles of data and find the one you want. Um, Anyway, so uh, we talked about this. You can file John Doe lawsuits and so on. Uh, you can send a subpoena to perform discovery. You file a complaint, which leads to civil discovery. And now um, they have to divulge information. And that's what I mean. This is before a lawsuit. You have a subpoena to find evidence. And then from the evidence, you decide whether you have enough for a lawsuit. And then, of course, you can turn this stuff into law enforcement if you want to. You can get the cops involved. The problem is you can't turn them off once you get them involved. And, what they do may very well not redound to the benefit of the company, like they might end up proving that it was your own company people that did the bad thing or something, yeah. you know. But you can do it. And of course, if you have child pornography, then you must contact the official FBI agent, the, uh, the task force, which yeah, here it is, the, uh, this is where you go to report violations, these guys. Um, uh, Department of Justice, you must tell them about sexual abuse or pornography. It is a huge issue. And you don't want to touch it. And any equipment that has evidence on it will be gone forever. It vanishes. Your investigation is over. Everything goes up there. The stuff is radioactive. Possessing it is a crime. Seeing it is a crime. Owning it is a crime. You have to forget whatever you were doing, give it to them, and, and run. It's radioactive. So, yeah. Sam, I uh, served in the Army with a uh, girl that ended up uh, with the Sheriff's Department, San Bernardino County. And she said, 
it was destroying her. There were so many cases of it. It was so prevalent. Uh, it, it, it blew me away that there was, uh, it wasn't just the, you know, you know, erratic, you know, ones and twosies. She said it was just an epidemic down there in San Bernardino County, and it was set from her, her soul. It's up here, too. It's in Washington, it's everywhere. There's a lot of pedophiles. You just look at the Roman Catholic Church. There's a lot of pedophiles out there. And it, people, want, people, it's like people that are in prison that are really innocent. You imagine it's 1%, but it's actually, it's a big problem. Um, it's all around us, it always has been, and it's beginning to come to the light. It's, that's why people, at first, they think they're just making it up, but it's not true. But you know, a lot of this stuff is really going on. And that's why they have special task forces and. You have to hand it to the feds and get out of the loop. Yeah. What about stuff like ticking time bomb or terrorism? <clears throat> well, terrorism, of course, well, terrorism, of course, is a high priority for law enforcement, but it's never that clear. So, I mean, if you find something, you can call the cops and everything, but then it's not the same issue. It's not like you're committing a crime just having possession of the information. We know you are in this case. That's why you have to, you have to get this stuff out of your hands quickly so that you're not responsible, for, and you can't erase it and forget about it. Whereas I think if you were to find like a bomb threat, you could erase it and forget about it, and that would not be a huge federal crime. I'm not sure. Really? Maybe someone could sue you later on the grounds that you should have warned them. But I think um, it's not the same as this at all. Or, anyway, and then, of course, foreign entities. If people are putting things in other countries, then, of course, this is getting pretty ridiculous to get cooperation from them. Uh, the Secret Service and the FBI can do it to a limited extent, but, you know, a company usually can't. Um, anyway, law enforcement has the ability to do this stuff. They can investigate and prosecute. They can put out subpoenas. They can even go across national boundaries to some extent. And all that is at no cost to your company. But of course, they do not have your company's priorities and goals. So they may not do what you want or the time speed that you want. So you know, if you're going to do this, then you have to maintain a chain of custody and have evidence that you can give them clearly. And uh, there are people that do this. For example, Kmart. I know the guy. He came and gives talks here. Brandon Gregg was the security officer at Kmart for years, and then he became the security officer at Seagate. And Kmart is so huge. There's a Kmart down south in the South Bay that has like 30,000 people a day. It's the size of a small city, and so they have a huge amount of crime in the store. <laughs> there are murders and rapes and stabbings in the store, and they have a DNA sequencer in the store. <laughs> they analyze blood samples and stuff, which is better than what the cops have, and they actually have detectives and man, uh, the cops inside the store, Kmart cops, you do a crime in Kmart, they will actually gather the evidence, run the DNA, and then hand it to the cops. Here's the guy, here's the proof, lock him up. And in fact, when you see them on TV, they have a commercial saying, we donated $300,000 of value to law enforcement last year. What that was, was letting the cops use their DNA sequence, which is better than what the cops can afford. You know, that's why he, he gave a fun talk here a few years ago, um, America's private police, spies, and armies. The corporations have their own stuff, which is often much better funded. And the guy is hilarious. He looks like James Bond. He brought in $80,000 bug sniffer to the class and sniffed the network and everything. So, They've got, they got, they got so much money, far more than the cops and the FBI and everything. They've got all the cool stuff. And they dress snazzy and he has a car like a wedge. You know. That was typical like in the wars, you know, with Blackwater. Yeah. Is it legal to collect, to not be law enforcement and to collect DNA? Yes, on company property. <coughs> Nobody has any expectation of privacy. They walked into Kmart. Kmart has the right to examine everything they do inside Kmart. What, what, take your hair, your blood, or? If you drop it on the floor in Kmart, it becomes theirs. I think so. I mean, I'm so not a lawyer. Can uh, extract it? No, I don't think they can like, force oh, you to give a blood sample, but they can see you. No, but I think any stupid company. Right? Yeah, I can just freak yeah, yeah, you. Yeah, but you leave fingerprints and sweat around. They, I think they can totally do it. Yeah. yeah, and of course, you can do almost anything to the employees, which is oh, another big issue. But even the customers, I think the fact that you walked into somebody's private property and wandered around, they totally have the right to photograph you and pick your hair follicles off the ground and whatever else. I think yeah. you have no reason. They say, look, you didn't have to go on Kmart. You could have gone somewhere else. So. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, um, so and then, of course, there's groups to join. InfraGuard is the public-private partnership of FBI. Um, they have meetings. Uh, the one that's really fun is the High Tech Crime Investigators Association. I mean, that one, that's the Secret Service. And they have very good meetings, very good talks. Um, you have to have some kind of law enforcement connection to get in. But uh, I was able to get in eventually. The only thing they really care about is you can never have been on the defensive side of any court proceeding. If you have, then you're the enemy. 
which is pretty rude, but that's the way it is. And here's other ones out there. Yeah. How do they know from an IP address that that came from Russia or South Korea? Well, or that is a Iran? huge... How do they know that? They don't know. That's the huge issue of attribution. I mean, they claim they know that North Korea hacked Sony, and they claim they know... And, and All they the have is IP address. Well, they have a lot more than the IP address. They have the malware, which you can analyze to see when it was compiled. They have the related malware from previous campaigns that came from the same place. They have the style of the code and the way they do things, which compares to other samples. So companies like Mandiant have a whole history, the way cops have profiles of criminal organizations that they use. So there's a lot more than just the IP address. But there's a perennial issue that you never really know. Um, attribution on the internet is quite a job, but I don't think it's really that different than being a cop and figuring out from, you know, footprints and blood spatters who did this thing. It's, you have some evidence, and you just have to be skillful enough to make a convincing trail. But it's not 100%. Do you think it was really the North Koreans? I think I have just a proxy. That's the problem. A lot of people do. The, the evidence, as far as I know, was never made public. So we really don't know. Uh, it's just a question of how much do you trust the government not to lie to you, and I think that's a laughable question these days. But. That's the same thing with the Russia investigation, though, isn't it? Like there's well, the Russia... Ever... Well, the whole Russia investigation is pretty baffling. I mean, yeah, it's, it's, it's a political issue now. I mean, certainly, it's... That's why I think the same thing was true of Nixon. I mean, Trump certainly did some bad things, but how much bad does he have to do before you impeach him? The answer is a whole lot. So does it reach that threshold? And that's a judgment call, and it's really a political issue. If people hate him enough, then he gets impeached. If people like him enough, then he doesn't get impeached. I think McCain uh, may have killed him. He, he burned a lot of bridges with how he handled You think? McCain. Well, I wondered about that, but it seemed like people forgot after a few days. It's hard to say. Yeah. Oh, no, I just... Yeah. Anyway, uh, it's, but it's, a, it's, it's not a simple... You know, when I was a kid, I believed the law. You know, it was the same for everybody, and the law is a matter of truth or falsehood, and it's not that way at all. It's more like a divorce. When are you mad enough to actually break up? There's not, there's not like a clear line. <laughs> anyway, um, so, by the way, I, at this meeting down south, they told me something good. He said, people get their SIEM system, like Splunk or something, and everything in your whole network depends on it. So he said, it is easier to get a divorce and find a new mate than to change to a different sim. <laughs> so uh, that is probably true. Anyway, um, let's see if I can get back to my cahoots. All right. I saved this, so here's the last cahoots. And then I'll just say a little bit about the project because I don't want to keep you here too long. Okay, every program and service in Windows is what? Okay, they are PE portable executable files. They are not all EXEs, some are DILs, and some are COMs, but they are all portable executable. That's the format. ELF is Linux, and PE is Windows. All right. So what item is in the PE header? OK, that's the import table telling you what libraries you're using. I did the first one. I knew it. Just what? Yep, takes a while. Put it up there. Anyway, so Tripwire sends you an alert, but it's a false positive. So what's wrong with this? That's a lack of veracity. It is not true. It tells you there's an attack, but there is no attack. Yeah. That's a failure of veracity. All right, what protocol gives you the easiest and fastest indications of malicious activity? DNS oh. gives you the easiest indicator. That's part of why we have a DNS security class here. DNS has really is useful as an indicator of attack, and um, it's also a target of attack. So Jeff Tom is six, Kaz is three, and... Uh, Start Zoom is going to have to tell me who they are, and that is probably what that chat message is doing. Um, we are here at 152. And here's the project. And I talked last time about Splunk, Boss of the Sock, which is a lot of fun, and nice people were at the event. In fact, you should tell me, give you extra credit. I rhyme me sometime. People who were at that, I know you were at it. Anyway, so, um, but here's the, okay, so Snort. Uh, you can turn on Snort on your Kali Linux. You got a Kali Linux, you set it up in project one or two. And it, if you now, if you want to use Snort to just see how it works, that's easy. If you actually want it to do any good, you have to do a bunch of complicated stuff, which we are not going to do. First, I just want you to understand how it works. So you just apt install Snort. 
Once you do that, it'll ask you what network you're on. So you have to give it the answer of your network subnet, which is usually these three numbers, a zero, and then a slash 24. You have to do IF config to see what network you're on. And then you just run snort. This will take the default snort configuration, sniff on the default interface, and give you all alerts. You can have only certain kinds of alerts. I want to see them all. It will then turn on all kinds of junk and then say commencing packet processing. This means snort is sniffing your network looking for suspicious traffic. So now that it's running, you go to another window and do tail minus F, which will follow the end of this file. Tail minus F shows you the end of a file, and it changes whenever the file changes, so you get a running log of what's going in that file. So that'll show you the alerts. And you can send suspicious traffic from your Windows server easily. All you have to do is install TFTP, which is an optional Windows component. You can do it in any version of Windows, but if for the one we've got here is Server 2016, so you do it in the Server Manager. Add, uh, add roles and features, and you can add the feature TFTP client. And that just lets you execute TFTP from the command line, which is a really old, really lame protocol for moving files around before FTP, very insecure, and that's why it's not included by default anymore. And if you were gonna, you can send a TFTP request to your server trying to get the shadow file. The shadow file contains password hashes. And you aren't supposed to get it, of course. Now, you are not going to get it because the Linux machine is not even running a TFTP server. But one of the many lame things about TFTP is it uses DNS. So it sends traffic. There is no handshake. So it sends traffic even to a machine that is not listening, and it gets there. So you're not going to get the file, and it will tell you the connect request failed. But Snort's going to hear it because the packets really go there. And Snort's going to trigger on it because Snort is not very smart. All Snort does is look at the packet to see if it contains shadow, and then it triggers. It doesn't have enough sense to notice, well, nothing's listening anyway. Nothing's going to happen. It's very simple. So that's going to trigger this rule, uh, an attempt to get shadow. And they treat that as successful administrator privilege game, which in my opinion is a pretty questionable thing to say about such a lame attack, which didn't in fact get anything. But anyway, that's the message that the, somebody in the Snort community put in their free Snort community rule. So anything that comes in with shadow in it will trigger this alert. So there's the rule. You can view the snort.conf. And when you do, down here you will find you include something called TFTP rules. That's what the snort.conf has. It's just many, many other files that are included in there. And if you look at that, you will find the TFTP rules. And here is the one in particular. And if it sees a TFTP get shadow, then it triggers. And somebody tried to get anything named shadow in any directory or TFTP. You can now send other traffic. Like you can try to get the shadow knows, and the rule will still go off because snort is really stupid. And that's the point. Here you see how it works. It is like the spam filters that look for certain words like Viagra. It's totally stupid. If that word is in there, it triggers. If that word is misspelled, it doesn't trigger. That's all it's doing is very simple. Another thing Snort does is detect buffer overflow attempts. If it finds long names, then it will find them. So if you give it 110 A's in the name of the file, it will give you another one uh, saying get file name. And this is what. So just see how this stuff working. That's the game. Um, so that's how Snort works. It's really, and then, if, now this Snort is very ineffective because in addition to just having the default rules, it has the default community rules from 2015. Yeah. If you want to get the modern rules to stop emerging threats, you have to sign up for a subscription and put in something called Oink Master yeah. that will update it. And it's kind of a lot of work. And I decided to not bother at all because of this. Virus Total totally does it for you, and Packet Total does it even more. Packet Total? Yes. So Virus Total, what you can do. You can download a malware traffic sample. This guy has a whole bunch of malware samples. And quite a few of them are real malware. So this one warns you, use, use your virtual machine. Don't use a real machine with, that you love not with it. personal data on it. Although this is not very bad malware, but some of this stuff has real malware in it. And um, so you unzip the sample. When you unzip it, you have to use this password, infected. This is the standard in the whole business. If you put up real malware samples, you always zip them with the password infected. Yeah. That way, everybody in the club that knows what's going on can get it, and nobody's going to open it by accident and take you to court and punish you for distributing malware or anything. That's the way we do it. <laughs> so once you've unzipped it, then send it up to VirusTotal. VirusTotal, you can just upload a file, and it will then analyze the file and tell you what it thinks. And it finds that this file in itself is not malware because it's a packet capture file. But what it is is malicious network traffic. And 
virus total has snort and suricata. Yeah. And it has the full snort with all the emerging threats. And suricata is another more advanced intrusion detection system. And it will totally tell you what they found, which is pretty awesome. So here's the snort alerts. So, and here's the suricata alerts. And when you expand them, the last several suricata alerts are pretty informative. You have something with a user agent of Mozilla that so looks like spyware. You have malvertising going to an exploit kit. You have a HTTP remote file inclusion on PHP. And you have a web bug. And so this, now this is, that's why I'm doing this. This is to show you what you get. This is not very much information, and that's all you get. The full packets are not here. This is the alert. This is the problem. You would have this kind of information, and then you need to find another source of information to find out more. So to find out more, you got to use a better tool like Wireshark that will really show you the packets. So open that stuff in Wireshark, and you can find out what happened. And in Wireshark, Wireshark, you see all the one-liner summary of the packets here. Here you see the details of this individual packet. And at the bottom, you see the binary stuff, which you very rarely look at. And the trick in Wireshark is to learn how to use filters here to quickly filter down to the interesting packets. Otherwise, you have thousands of packets, and you waste your time hunting for them. So HTTP is where you're going to find files transferred. And here, we, the warning told us the user agent had something funny in it. So that user agent is part of an HTTP GET request. So we don't care about any packets but HTTP. And here's how you use Wireshark. You find a packet you like. You look in here, and you can right-click on any field, and you can zero in on that field. So you can right-click on this user agent field, and you can apply it as a column. And it will now show you that entire column with all the values in it. And you can then click on it to sort. So your user agent, you can sort by. This is what a real user agent looks like. It's about 40 characters long. It's got Mozilla, i.e. long junk. These are the fake ones. That's obviously a fake user agent. There is no version of a browser that is just Mozilla. It's this long junk. So these three get requests are the malicious ones. And you can very quickly find them this way. This is a very good thing to learn how to use the simple filter how to quickly find, add another field and sort by it to find what you need. Now you can examine the malicious gets, which bring down malware. And here they are. And here you can see another common trick. It's getting something called claim. <coughs> then it has parameters. Pardon equals anything, peeve, September, former, click. Yes. This is just like you see in spam email. It's random words. This is what you get. This is how you send information out of a network. You take random words or random letters, and you put them in something like a GET request or a DNS request. There is not really some kind of Perl script on the server looking for these parameters. These are random words encoding something, like stolen passwords or information about the botnet command and control center. This is, these are probably beacons. And you, the malware encodes the beacons in something that will look like normal traffic to the IDS. That's the plan. But for some reason, they were dumb enough to use a fake user agent. And Suricata caught that, although Snort did not. Hmm. And now we can see another clue. The URL is this random garbage, which doesn't look very legit, on a funny port, which really doesn't look legit. HTTP should be going to port 80. Going to a port like that is a pretty strong indication that this is up to no good. So this is a malware command and control domain. And it, then we can look for the PHP file inclusion. This said a local file inclusion attack. So you can do HTTP. And then you can filter for HTTP and frame contains PHP. Yeah? Would Wireshark log that request if there was a firewall blocking the outgoing connection? Uh, if there was a firewall blocking the outgoing connection, you would never get this far. It would never do the handshake. Okay. And the get would never happen. That's why if you want to analyze malware, you have to run a fake internet so it can finish the handshake. A very good question. Um, Anyway, so, um, so if you want to look at PHP, then you do HTTP and frame contains PHP. That will give me the requests with PHP in them. And in particular, I'll see the ones that fetch PHP pages. And there's really only a few of them. And here's the one that triggered the alert. It's get like PHP. That, and what, what Suricata did was it noticed that I got a PHP page. And then in one of the parameters, I put a URL. And that is what you typically do for remote file inclusion. This is, in fact, a false positive. This is just a Facebook like. And a Facebook like has this structure that looks like a malware, like a malicious attack. This is another important thing to see. This is your false. There is traffic that looks a little funny, which will trigger your system, but it's not an attack. It's just a legitimate piece of traffic that happens to use an unexpected pattern of data. So that's not malware.
and uh, you can get all the attachments which just Wireshark will totally give you all the files. You don't have to do anything other than file export objects, HTTP. You'll get all the files that were transmitted by HTTP. It'll reconstruct them from the packets and save them as files. Very handy. You get all about 50 or 100 files here. Most of them are images and such. And unfortunately, the real malware is not anywhere here. The real malware moved as an encrypted zip file that Wireshark can't remove. So these are all innocent files, but it gave me something to have you turn in to show that you got this far. And there are answer documents on the site this came from that give you more details if you want to go there. But the last one after this I just got up before class is Packet Total. There is another product. Virus Total is a <coughs> Google product that runs all the antivirus engines. And I didn't know this, also runs Snort and Suricata, which is nice. Packet Total is a similar thing, and it runs Bro for free, all set up for you. And that's why I'm really moving away from setting things up and they're just using them here because there are all these services you can use that have it all set up to go. And if you're working at a company, there will be a technical team that got it set up. And then you'll have a much bunch of analysts learning how to use it, not how to set it up. So um, again, use a virtual machine because you're working with real malware here. Bring up packet total. Looks like virus total. Obviously, it's an imitation of it. You can upload a file. So um, you have to say, I'm not a robot. And then it warns you, all the packet total things become public knowledge. Ah. Same thing's true of virus total. That's why at a real company, you probably can't send real company data up here. You probably violate your confidentiality, but it's good for training purposes. That's why a company would have to have their own bro server to use that does not spray the answer to the whole world the way this does. But you can run it here, and now it will give you many tabs. So here's malicious activity. It's finding some DNS malformed requests and forming some uh, use of Tor, somebody's going to dot .onion sites, <laughs> which is either malware or it's people on your network using Tor, which is probably something they should not be doing. So they're right that that's pretty suspicious. If you go on the Suspicious Activity tab, it will give you more IDS alerts. Here is recognized malware, 39% detection rate by, by antivirus engines. Um, and it even gives you the virus total link to go learn about the malware. So it found a file, reconstructed the file from the network traffic, got the hash and looked it up and found out what it is, which is pretty handy. And this is just an invalid SSL certificate, which is not that exciting, but it's a fake Microsoft certificate. So that also tends to suggest that there's a fake Microsoft update or something going on here. But anyway, if you go to that link, you can learn about the malicious file that Packet Total figured out at Virus Total. And 56 out of 58 en 68 engines find it malicious. It's a Trojan here, and you can go here and get more information about it. It's, here's what it does on the system. Now, here's another important thing about virus total. Uh, in our in malware analysis class, we're doing dynamic analysis, where we run a virtual machine, we run the malware, we run a bunch of tools to see what it does. Virus total will do that for you. It has two sandboxes. It has their own sandbox. and has something called the Tencent Habo sandbox. It will do that for you in the cloud for free. So you go here. It runs the file in their virtual machine, it monitors the traffic, and it shows you the results. This is really pretty awesome. That's why I say I'm, I'm moving away from bothering to configure stuff yourself. Um, you can get to the point without being the guy that set it up. So here's what I found. Here's the files it opened, and there's the files it wrote to, and the registry keys it made, and the network traffic it made is all just right there for you. So here's all the registry keys it opened. And uh, then if you go back to packet total, you can get the files. It will extract the files for you free online. You go to Extracted Executable Files, and it just finds them, and you can just download them. Uh. It's bloody awesome. <laughs> so it found two of them. One of them is the one it figured out before. One it didn't was this one, the Windows XP version. You can download the Windows XP version and then send it up to Virus Total. And uh, looks like I got the wrong image there which is going to be pretty annoying. Um, so I got to fix this last image in my project, but you send it up to virus total and you'll see and analyze it. Um, so anyway, I wanted to point you to that stuff. Um, yeah, this is, I'm very pleased with it. It's very easy to learn what you need to learn without struggling with virtual machines and networking and crap like that, which is getting kind of old. <laughs> now everything's in the cloud. Virus Total also checks websites, too. Yes, yeah. Virus Total will check websites, all for free, too. Now, there are some companies that pay for subscriptions, which apparently are very expensive. And then they have private Virus Total pages. And uh, at this meeting uh, I went to on Sunday, the guy there was sneering at analysts who demand that they have a Virus Total subscription. He said, what kind of wimp are you anyway? <laughs> uh, but 
anyway, that is what some people do is just pay for your own private virus total and just use it for everything, and then they, they let it do all the thinking. And he was saying, that's not good enough. You have to do better. But anyway, that's where we're going. That's a good place to start. Anyway, that's what I wanted to show you. Um, so I'll clean up and go to the lab, help anybody who wants to work there.